And we are live. Welcome to the Fox Trout Sierra podcast. Attempt number two. We'll talk about that later. And here we go. Fox Road Sierra Podcast. Once again, this is your host, Franco Sonera. All right, uh, before I kick off with the announcements, I really need to uh, check something out just to make sure everything is ready to go because I got to be, I, I'm everything. I'm my own director, my own producer, my own host, my own content creator. Man, this is hard. <laughs> but uh, give me a second. Yeah, it looks like we won't be doing the sound effects today because somehow they are not working. But I will deal with that later. Actually, you know what? Just give me one sec. Uh, actually, while I've configured this problem, uh, Instagram, uh, follow me on uh, Instagram where I. Hang on, sorry, sorry for that, guys. Ah, uh, no wonder it doesn't work. <laughs> okay all right so we won't deal deal with any uh sound uh sound any funky sounds i usually do today because my able light needs a update I i'm not too happy with that right now Ugh. okay i did not see that coming <laughs> anyway uh instagram follow me on instagram at the fox out see a podcast where i post like various short clips short pictures and yeah, stuff like that. Uh, various news. It acts like, like my website. So, but yeah, go go check that out. Uh, YouTube handle. Uh, YouTube handle is uh, at the Fox Rose Sierra Podcast, where you can find me really easily instead of like this whole bunch of like letters and numbers. So it's a lot easier over there. Uh, follow me. Give it a like on your way in. Uh, Reddit. Uh, Reddit.com slash you slash Fox Rose Sierra Pod. Um, uh, same concept. I post like various like pictures and give it a little description over there. Go ahead, give it a like. And last but not least, uh, TikTok. Once again, I have no idea how long TikTok's gonna last, but if it's still around, follow me over there at the Fox Road Sierra Podcast and give it a like on your way in and like and subscribe to subscribe to the channel. And I don't think that's even gonna work. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I'm playing on my phone right now. Let's make sure that everything works. No, but... Okay, sound bites are relevant right now. What's most relevant is the slideshows and the video about the one of the show. Okay, so let's uh, review the last episode. This is why I do the rewind. I, I, I can't... I, I suck at making sounds. All right, I'm just not going to do it. How about that? Okay, uh, we kind of reviewed uh, the no Normandy Invasion. Uh, operational Overlord, particularly Juno Beach. Uh, we went over the op Operation Overlord. Uh, we went over the uh, the plans, and we went over the deception of the plan. Uh, Operation Fortitude, Fortitude North, and Fortitude South. Uh, Fortitude North uh, consists of practically uh, two, like two so-called like invasion fronts: one in one in Norway, and one in Port, Port uh, Pas de Calais. Again. Go over there and uh, just give it a like. Hey, actually, you know what? I, I think I do have some sounds here. Just give me a second here. I, I got it on the actual um, stream yard, though, but it, it's it's limited. So I can only do uh, little bits like uh, me being retarded. Like, 
I don't wonder if that works. Hang on. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay. We do have some sound bites. So, uh, yep. Yeah, because you know me. You'll never surrender. <laughs> Thank you, StreamYard, for uh, having me, um, having this backup for me that I totally forgot about. So, in the meantime, I need to chill. Like, Daddy, chill. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, that actually makes me happy knowing that I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. Okay. Anyway. Um, back to uh, reviewing last episode. We also went over the uh, seven, the uh, the German seven, uh, seven sixteen stack division and the Ostlegion, uh, basically German foreign fighters. Uh, and also we went through over the Atlantic Wall and Fortress Europe. Uh, we went over um, oh sorry, brief fire. Um, uh, on Field Marshal uh, Rommel's uh, refortifications because he was assigned to the uh, the the defensive wall. All right. Now, back to um. Hang on. Yep. Uh, back to this episode. Uh, Operation Market Garden. All right. Okay, what you see right in front of you is the uh the broad uh the broad strategy front. I oh, sorry, the broad front strategy, because uh, practically on the first of September. Uh, Eisenhower took over or took control of the entire ground campaign on that region and that uh, his forces would advance on his broad front, uh, practically uh, going through uh, planting multiple divisions and pushing the Germans back to Germany through France. Of course, Montgomery uh, respectively objected to this plan, uh, believing that taking the war region, of course, if you guys know my, um, uh, back my well, my, my post World War One episode, the Ruhr region is a vital area that consists of vast materials that the German mil that the German war machine needs to continue its uh, production, i.e., tanks, rifles, and bolts and such. Right, and so I'm going to believe that if he would take the Ruhr region, like somehow button hook north of the Siegfried Line, which the Siegfried Line is practically the German border, like the like in defense. And by uh, taking the Ruhr region, uh, he will have a gateway towards Antwerp. And that way, uh, it will solve their logistical problems that I'm going to tell you very soon. And he wants to lead his operation. However, uh, Eisenhower was very hesitant on letting him lead his operation because, for one, uh, Americans really do want to follow Montgomery. And within good reason. Uh, there's the old saying, never shit on the help. Okay, and Montgomery really didn't have anything nice to say about Americans. And Americans are very, very, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they they really loathe him for that. They really don't like it. They really dislike him for that. Let's put it that way. And they believe in that Montgomery leading Americans, yeah, they're, they're not going to follow his orders. Though, but, hey, whether you like it or not, Whatever commander is in command, you got to follow him whether you like it or not. That's just the military machine. That's just the way it is. Like, like DL Saint kind of went in depth detail about this. Uh, the way, anyway, uh, Montgomery did had a point about the uh, logistical issues, um, challenging the broad front strategy, the, the broad strategy front, uh, the, <laughs> the broad front strategy. Ah, uh, ah, uh, damn it. <laughs> I gotta give myself that. Uh, anyway, uh, anyway, he did have a point about. Um, let me start that again. Let me start start that again. Uh, Montgomery did have a point about. Um, oh my god, I can't even think right now, guys. <laughs> anyway, okay, here we go. But however, Montgomery does have a point about uh, the logistical issues uh, challenging uh, Montgomery's uh, broad front strategy. Uh, basically, you, you're getting your supplies all the way from Normandy. All right, that's the only uh, main su main uh, support uh, supply base they have. And from, as we can see through the slides here, 
Okay, that's like from the German front line as of August 26th, because the day before, the Free French and the U.S. forces practically uh, entered Paris and liberated. And after, uh, this is from September 14th, uh, just like, this practically uh, three days before Operation Mark Gar uh, Market Garden actually takes place. Okay. All right, good. It's working. I just wanted. I just wanted to check that out, guys. Okay, so, and from Normandy to the second front is practically four hundred and fifty kilometers, four hundred and fifty kilometers worth of field that the Allies are burning just to get to to their objectives. And again, this is a problem that the Allies are facing. Okay, but either way, something had to be done. On September 4th, I kind of forgot to uh, mention this on the timeline. Actually, let's go to the timelines first. Uh, 30th of August, uh, after liberating Reims, uh, the United States 3rd Army crosses the Meuse River. Okay, which is over... Ah, right, yeah. Okay, on the 3rd of September, the British liberate uh, the Belgian capital of Brussels. And this is uh, when uh, the 4th of September, uh, they also liberate Antwerp, the prize. That's, that's the good news. The bad news is the uh, the Scheldt Estuary, not the Schleck. I really didn't pronounce that correctly the last time, though I'm correcting myself this time. Uh, the Scheldt, which is a, uh, a river basin right here that has complete access to the Atlantic. And that, my friends, is controlled by the Germans. Okay, and but still something had to be done. Uh, this arrows, I kind of point out, those are the, that's the Canadian vans. Uh, practically, they're in charge of taking uh, pretty much the northern uh, part of France and practically up in the lowlands. Which is why, uh, at the end of the war, Canada is so famous for liberating the Netherlands. And that's why uh, they, the Netherlands kind of like, you know, still honor that to this day. Much to say that apparently if you have a Canadian passport in the Netherlands, you're treated like a, you're treated like gold, apparently. Though, but I don't know. I haven't been to the Netherlands yet, but it is in the plans. Though, but I will check that uh, myth for myself. We'll see. But anyway. Uh, and also the pro problem with, uh, uh, Eisenhower's broad strategy front is they are so further ahead of Normandy, which is their main supply base, that the Germans can actually retreat faster than the Allies can advance, allowing the Germans time to rest and recuperate the troops and reposition their troops. Uh, hence, uh, building the Siegfried line. Okay, so, but however, Montgomery did come up with a kind of a daring and ambitious plan that we're going to talk about that may end the war before Christmas. All right. Okay, uh, this map right here, uh, this is, um, uh, part of the Netherlands. Uh, I kind of had to put it in like two different pictures because like I really want to give you guys like the full picture of it. So first picture is south. Uh, second picture is north. And you have the city of Uden over here as a reference point. Okay, just so you can guys get an idea. So put that picture on top of this picture here. Got it? Good. Sweet. All right. Okay, so the plan. Okay, we uh, we talked about uh, Eisenhower's broad strategy front um, uh, causing a logistical problem. So therefore, Montgomery uh, come up with this plan that it is quite larger than Overlord and it consists of many troops and many tanks and many planes to do so. So, but again. This also uh, proves to be a logistical nightmare. So we will talk more, more on that later. But anyway, uh, Eisenhower did give him the green light on this plan. So, okay. So this plan is called Operation Market Garden. 
Okay, so there are two major elements to uh, Monty's plan. Okay, Operation Market and Operation Garden. Operation Market consists of paratroopers taking key bridges for 30 Corps, who is an Operation Garden. So, Operation Garden, which consists of ground forces, a mixture of infantry and armored tanks, and also known as the British uh, 30 Corps. Their objective is to link up with the airborne troops along the road leading up to, to Arnhem and eventually right up to uh, Zerdizi, which is the, the northernmost bay on the, of the Netherlands. All right, so here are here is a plan for Operation Market Garden. So you have 30 Corps starting from the Belgian border. Actually, they weren't actually there. Uh, they're actually more further south down here. Um, hang on. Okay, so 30 Corps is stationed right in right in south of uh Valkus, uh Valkuswald. And their job is to pretty much like drive up the road. And they need to cross these bridges, but who's gonna secure them? Paratroopers. Okay, so you have the 101st Airborne. <clears throat> uh, their job is to uh, secure crossings over canals at Eindhoven. And oh, uh, I kind of forgot uh, to mention, uh, let's go back. Um, 30 Corps. They have to track 63 miles in two days from start to Arnhem. Like, that is a big schedule, big tight schedule to keep. To, to keep. Again, this is another problem of Operation Market Garden. Again, we will talk more on that later. Hey, uh, the United States 82nd Airborne Division, uh, their, their job is to secure the bridges over the Moss at the city of Grav and the wall at Nijmegen. Okay, that is their area. And their job is to secure a main key bridge, Nijme Nijmegen Bridge. Without Nijmegen Bridge, you may as well cancel the operation. So the Germans are not going to blow it up because they need Nijmegen as well. And you have the famous British First Airborne, uh, parach par paratrooping eight to ten miles east of Arnhem, and, and you're like, whoa, 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 what the f is going? On? Like, why can't they just drop it right into the city? Well, uh, the commanding officer, um, Major General Wally Urquhart, did propose that to uh, to air marshals of the Royal Air Force and the United States Army Air Force, so but. The Air Force's argument was they could not lose a single aircraft due to heavy flak fire because Arnhem is so close to the German border that they cannot lose a single plane because they need these planes for the other ways of the airborne drops. Which, again, it, it, the airborne drops itself, it, it, it's so huge and it crosses so many paratroopers, they cannot drop them all at once. So they have to drop them in waves. And again, that is a problem because the whole point of uh, paratrooping is shock and like shock and surprise. Uh, it's supposed to disorient the enemy enough to be like, whoa, 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 what the f is going on? And by the time the enemy enemy kind of figures out what's going on there, the paratroopers already done its job. Whether it's uh, blowing up a bridge, captured prisoner, whatever their mission is. No, but however, three waves. Okay. They did got the Germans at the first surprise. However, right, and later waves, they, they kind of picked it up later. So the, the the element of surprise was completely vanished. Anyway, anyway uh, the British First Airborne, uh, their objective is to drop an Arnhem and seize its bridge over the Lower Rhine. Uh, Arnhem Bridge and the Secondary Bridge, which is the railway bridge that... Um, that really, really kind of, you know, wasn't their main objective. Arnhem Bridge was their main objective. And British uh, First Airborne is supported by the Polish First Independent Parachute Brigade. And, of course, you probably didn't know this, though, but as soon as the operation is ended and the tanks roll over up to Arnhem, uh, the British 52nd Lowland Infantry Division will be flown in on the fifth day of the invasion after d land airfield had been captured by whether it's the British or the Polish. And they're supposed to uh, secure uh, Arnhem right after. The what? reason why I didn't hear that because, spoiler, it didn't happen. Okay. 
So there you have it. And this is the road, the uh, 63 mile road that 30 core had to drive up. And that is a big stretch, you guys. Okay, so the 101st Airborne has to take like at least uh, five bridges. And the 82nd, they have to capture at least like three or four. Uh, the British only had to capture two, one mainly. So they think they had the easy job. Yeah, parachuting eight to ten miles behind, uh, uh, west of Arm because the pilots are too scared to be shot down. Yeah, that really didn't help out the British very well. And controversially, Urquhart really got a lot of crap for it because somehow, for some reason, it was his call to drop his own paratroopers eight to ten miles west of Arnhem, but. He argued that he wanted to drop into Arnhem. In fact, some of his troops kind of went rogue and wanted to go drop to Arnhem, Arnhem at Arnhem on a single plane. Though, so, but that plane was scrapped at last minute. So, whatever. It is what it is. All right. Now, we have the uh, commanders of, this, of the whole operation. Okay, so you have uh, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, which is the... Uh, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces, also known as Shafe, Shafe Commander, or whatever you like to call it. Uh, then you have uh, our, the famous uh, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, Commander of the 21st Army Group, also the lead planner of the operation. Uh, guys, under him, uh, Lieutenant General Frederick Browning. Uh, he's the Deputy Commander of the 1st uh, the Army uh, Airborne, uh, the 1st Allied Airborne Army. Of course, the uh, the actual commander of that of that of the unit is uh, General Lewis Barrington of the United States Army Air Force. Uh, excuse me. The uh, reason why I put uh, Browning on here because he was the he, he was known as the father of paratroopers, and so he commands both the British and the Americans. And of course, uh, okay, here are the uh, commanders of the, um, of, of, the of the paratroopers. All right, so first you have uh, Major Major General uh, Roy Urquhart of the British First Airborne Division. Oh, I believe we have our first chat here. Hang on, guys. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. I have watched one of your video. Uh, I have. I have. I, sorry, um, I'm terrible reading. I'm not gonna lie. I haven't watched one video of yours, but I do subscribe because I want to be less ignorant when it comes to history. So just saying, I appreciate all your videos you put out, dude. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much, man. I would give you a Don Marco for that, but then again, my soundboard's not working. <laughs> Though, but I appreciate the love, brother. All right. Anyway. I just got to switch back over here. That, that was pretty good. I appreciate that love, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I feel good now. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Uh, where was I? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, after British First Airborne, uh, we have uh, his sidekick, uh, Brigadier General uh, Stanislaw Sol Sosabowski. Uh, he's the commander of the uh, Polish First Independent Parachute Brigade. Uh, their job is, is to drop three days after... Uh, the British uh, paratroops down. So, but they get delayed a couple days due to fog. And that kind of makes the troops a little bit more antsy because if you like, because you got to understand well, like what, what kind of happened before Operation Market Garden. Uh, out, the Allies had like various like operations for other par parachute drops. So, but they were canceled at the very last second every time. So every time you do it, every time when the troops are getting ready, cock, like locked and loaded, ready to go, all of a sudden, canceled. And the troops are like, damn it, they, they get themselves so hyped up over nothing. Do that multiple times. Oh, that that really, that really, really, really want to get them in the fight. And that actually uh, clouds their judgment, if you think about it. Because once they uh, actually get into the drop zone, mistakes can happen. Uh, call it, uh, I don't know, Dutch Courage, whatever. So, but yeah, that, that causes problems as well, the uh, delays. Uh, anyway, moving on. Moving on. Uh, next one is uh, Brigadier General James Gavin of the United States 82nd Airborne Division. 
uh, this guy is practically in charge of trying to take the bridge over at Nijmegen. Oh. All right. Uh, next is uh, Major General Maxwell D. Taylor of the United States 101st Airborne Division. Uh, that name might be familiar since uh, if you're a fan of uh, HBO's uh, Band of Brothers, like I am, uh, if, if you're a war historian, like you must watch Band of Brothers. That is a given. <laughs> that is a right a passage if you want to like be into this stuff. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. Uh, next, uh, reason why I have this guy here, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, John Frost, uh, also from the British uh, First, is because he was in charge of uh, taking at the, the actual bridge itself. Because what happened after uh, the British uh, dropped on day one, uh, Urquhart kind of split his forces. Uh, actually, uh, some troops kind of secured north, south, East, West, and however you have you, you have a group of men commanded by uh, John Frost himself would actually uh, go south through uh, the sel uh, southern part of Ustabeek, which is a city west of Arnhem, uh, through uh, southern Arnhem. Uh, okay. If you watch the movie uh, A Bridge Too Far, it, it may look uh, John Frost kind of went to Arnhem Bridge unposed. Yeah, th th that's full of crap. Uh, because they did uh, meet resistance. Uh, they, they met like uh, German recon, uh, recon patrol, which they kind of wiped out. And they did try to uh, take the railway bridge that we talked about, which, by the way, it wasn't their main objective. But they decided, you know what? Eh, what the hell? Let's see if we can try it anyway, right? So, but right the last second, it, the bridge blew it up right in their faces. No one got hurt. So, but they were thinking, ah, damn it. Oh, well, wasn't our bridge anyway. Uh, the main prize is Arnhem Bridge, so they got to get to that bridge. So, and which they did, and waiting for relief either from rest of rest of uh, Urquhart's troops or Thirty Corps. And oh, these men held on. These men held on. <laughs> okay, last but not least for the Allies is um, Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks, uh, the British uh, Thirty Corps commander. All right, of. Uh, Again, this, yeah, this is a another commander that's, uh, you know, very well respected. Again, if you watch uh, the movie uh, "I Bridge Too Far," you'll you'll see his uh, charisma kind of played. Uh, that actor who played uh, Horace did a really good job. I'll I'll give him that. All right, uh, the Germans now. Okay, our good old friend uh, General Field Marshal Gerald von Rundstedt, uh, the commander of Ob West, which is kind, which is. Practically a station up in that region, uh, sorry, right up in the lowlands. Uh, some of them is uh, General Field Marshal uh, Walter Mosel, aka the Fireman. If you would review my uh, Battles of Stalingrad Kirk's episode, uh, he was mentioned in there. And okay, last but not least, uh, oh, uh, Open Group, uh, Over Group in Fear, uh, uh, Villaheim Beatrick, uh, the second SS Panzer Division station, station in Arnhem. Okay, right, so um, uh, Von Rundstedt knew that the Allies are going to come soon. So uh, he would think that either uh, Patton or Montgomery would lead the operation. But in truth, uh, he kept Patton out of the operation. I, I said correction. Eisenhower kept Patton out of the operation because he knew that Montgomery and Patton really didn't get along. Look at Sicily. Look at how those two work together. Oh, God, their egos went just right in their heads. That Germans just slipped right out of Messina. Again, just look at my uh, <laughs> look at my uh, Sicily episode. Uh, I go in depth detail on that. And, ooh, ooh, let's talk about the, uh, the intel that the Allies had. All right. This drawing right here is practically the whole entire operation. Oh. Practically the whole entire operation uh, stage of uh, Operation Market Garden. All right, let's go see this over here. Yes, yeah, take a good look at it because, like, I'm going to play a video that kind of describes, like, the whole thing. Uh, Copland's of the Imperial War Museum. 
Uh, go over there and subscribe to them. They got some really, really good stuff there. So, but I do plan on visiting this museum one day if I ever go to the UK. The United Kingdom, I mean. Uh, yeah, so uh, just take a good look at this. Uh, look at the plans here and see, give you, give you an idea of what Operation Market's all about. So you have a blown out picture of a map from practically from Eindhoven all the way up to Arnhem. And this is a kind of a more blown up picture of Arnhem itself. I uh, see right here, this is where the Polish landed uh, south of Drill. And this is Arnhem itself. Here's the bridge where Frost Troops is. And here's the rest of uh, British uh, first, uh, first Brigade Parachute. Yeah, that's, that's pretty far, man. <laughs> and they expect them to, you know, do a job well done. Yeah, to add insult to injury, their radios weren't working. And to add further insult to injury, half their jeeps haven't arrived and quarter of the troops never made the landings, particularly shot down, like actually their glider troops. All right. Okay, what else I was going to talk about? Um... All right. Anyway. Sorry, just give me a second, guys. Because somehow my phone's not working because I kind of need this for the next thing I'm about to do. All right. This video I'm about to show you, again, is the Confidence of Imperial War Museum. Uh, it will give you a... A detailed operation on Operation Market Garden. So, without, and we will break it down together. Just give me a moment. Takes my secondary screen. All right, without further ado, Imperial War Museum. After breaking out from Normandy in the summer of 1944, Allied forces had advanced through the French countryside at breakneck speed. The German forces before them appeared to be finished, and the war surely won. Allied Supreme Commander General Eisenhower planned to advance on a broad front, with multiple army groups converging on Germany simultaneously. However, there was a problem. The Allies were unable to supply the necessary food, fuel and ammunition for all of the units to advance at once. But one British general felt like he had the solution. I'm standing in the tactical headquarters of Field Marshal Montgomery, which comprised his three operational caravans. Montgomery believed that he had the answer to defeating the Germans without the need for the broad front strategy. He decided that it would be best for the Allies to employ one bold stroke, which would place them on the frontiers of Germany and possibly end the war by Christmas 1944. The battle would become one of the most controversial episodes of the Second World War, featuring daring assaults, strategic blunders and heroic defences. A battle which would come so close to success before falling at the final hurdle. This is the story of Operation Market Garden. Montgomery's plan would begin with a huge parachute drop, with airborne forces seizing key bridges throughout the Netherlands. The American 101st Airborne would seize the bridges at Son and Vagel. The American 82nd Airborne would capture the bridges at Grave and Nijmegen, while the British 1st Airborne, augmented by the Polish 1st Parachute Brigade, would take the road and rail bridges at Arnhem. Meanwhile, the British 30 Corps would break out from their positions on the Merzesco Canal and drive up Highway 69 to relieve the paratroopers. They planned to reach Arnhem by the fourth day at the latest, before the 52nd Lowland Infantry Division flew into Deleen Airfield the following day. It was a bold plan, but if it worked, it could put Allied forces across the Rhine and on Germany's border, ready to strike the killing blow. And that killing blow is the rural region. Again, well, without uh, Germany's military production, it they're, they're done. I'm now standing in Montgomery's office caravan, where he would have devised the plan that became Operation Market Garden. The walls of the caravan were lined with photographs of enemy generals. That's because Montgomery believed 
he'd be better able to understand their thinking and in consequence defeat them. Operation Market Garden was the largest airborne landing in military history. Unfortunately, the plan had inherent flaws. Many in Allied leadership believed that the German army in the West was near breaking point. In fact, the German forces in the Netherlands had recently been reinforced by the 9th and 10th SS Panzer divisions. Though they were in the area to rest and refit and weren't less than half strength, they could still pose a serious threat to the lightly armed paratroopers. Allied intelligence confirming their presence near the landing grounds was dismissed. And there were even bigger problems. Surprise! is the key element of successfully landing airborne troops. At Market Garden, this element was surrendered because the landings took place over three successive days due to a lack of sufficient transport aircraft. In respect of the bridged Arnhem, due to fears about German anti-aircraft defences, the parachutists were dropped eight miles away from their objective. Lightly armoured parachute troops must capture their objectives quickly before the enemy has time to respond in strength. The plan for Operation Market Garden made that more difficult. Yeah, the reason why they say that made them more difficult, because again, like I mentioned before, they're doing it in waves. The reason why they're doing it in waves, because they don't have enough uh, transport planes to actually drop these paratroopers. So at the first wave, yeah, you got the Germans by surprise, uh, in fact, uh, it caught Mona by surprise, uh, because he was, uh, he was stationed over at the, uh, Hartenstein Hotel, uh, which was, uh, practically right in the, uh, Usti, like, right in the center of the Usti Big Pocket. That this video was going to show very, very soon. Uh, however, uh, uh, Mona was like, why would the British paratroopers drop all the way here? Because he thought, like, oh my god, they're trying to capture me. Get me out of here now. So he ended up going to uh, uh, Beatrix headquarters and took that over uh, right into the city of Arnhem itself. I think uh, north of Arnhem, I believe. Despite the warnings, on the 17th of September 1944, Operation Market Garden began. The drops were highly accurate and the paratroopers were able to form up and quickly take their objectives. The 101st were able to capture the bridge at Weigel and hold it against German counterattacks. The bridge at Sonn was blown by the Germans, but luckily the short span over the canal could be bridged by Allied engineers. Meanwhile in the north at Arnhem, half the British forces defended the drop zones while the other half advanced the eight miles into Arnhem itself. Led by John Fries himself. However, the rail bridge was blown and strong German resistance stopped all but one British battalion from reaching Arnhem Road Bridge. The group, led by Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, took up positions on the north end of the bridge and awaited relief. The 82nd managed to capture the smaller bridge at Grave, but the larger bridge at Nijmegen was a different story. The River Val was fast and wide and could not be bridged easily. Without it, Operation Market Garden would be over before it started. General James Gavin, commander of the American Airborne Forces at Nijmegen, prioritised capturing the Grosbeek Heights, which overlooks Nijmegen. This was to guard against the danger of a German counterattack from the forest that bordered the heights. Subsequently, there weren't sufficient troops to successfully capture Nijmegen Bridge, and in fact, attempts to take it were repelled by the Germans. For the offensive to succeed, the bridge at Nijmegen would have to be captured quickly. Meanwhile, 30 Corps' advance was also falling behind. After a massive artillery barrage, the Allied tanks broke out from their positions but came under fire from both sides at the exposed Highway 69. As the first day drew to a close, they had covered only seven, the planned 13 miles. The second day of the operation was marked by poor weather, delaying the next parachute drop. At Arnhem, further attacks went in to try and reach the road bridge, but thanks to communication problems, they were pushed back with heavy losses. Okay, you can already see Operation Mark Garnet is not going well at all. Everyone is behind schedule. Okay, why did Operation Mark Garnet rely so much on coordinated timing? They should have learned the lessons of the failed sleeping plan that the Germans tried to do back in the First World War. Remember that? Uh, go back to episode uh, two. I go in depth detail on, uh, on this shit. Uh, basically, uh, that plan itself required on uh, heavy logistics, which was way too ahead of its time. And 
practically uh, coordinated strike timing, which again failed. Again, Mark Garner is doing the exact same thing. Even even Normandy Invasion was, uh, you know, they it, it wasn't really all a success. You're probably like, whoa, 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 what the f? Like they established Beachhead. Well, they did, yes. Though, but their objective was at the end of June six, all five beaches were supposed to link up with one another. Oh, sorry, on on June uh, on the end of June six. Correction, on, on the end of June six, uh, all five beaches are were supposed to connect with one another by the like by the end of the night, but that did not happen. Uh, they can only accomplish that a week later. See what I mean? Because that's what the old saying goes: uh, "No plan survives contact with the enemy." Meanwhile, Frost's group at the bridge itself destroyed a major German armored force attempting to cross the bridge. This photograph clearly shows the wreckage from their burnt-out vehicles. At Nijmegen, the 82nd easily beat off the anticipated German counterattack on the Grossbeek Heights. But thanks to the delayed second parachute drop, the vital bridge at Nijmegen would have to wait another day to be captured. Further south, 30 Corps finally linked up with the 101st near Eindhoven. Engineers worked through the night to construct a Bailey Bridge at Somme, replacing the one destroyed there the day before. By the morning of the third day, it was complete. Okay, again, this puts uh, 30 Corps way behind schedule. But, like, the more time they waste, more troops get killed over at Arnhem. Again, you see, there's a problem here. That same morning, the 1st Airborne began their biggest attack yet to try and relieve Frost's men besieged at Arnhem. Once again, they were beaten back, this time with even heavier losses. Unable to break through and facing multiple German counterattacks, they formed a pocket of their own near the town of Oosterbeek. But holding on there would be a major challenge. For airborne troops operating behind enemy lines, resupply is crucial because they can't carry much in the way of equipment, ammunition or food. However, the resupply intended for the 1st Airborne Division at Arnhem and Oosterbeek fell into German hands. They knew when they were going to take place and they had captured ground marking equipment and flares in order to decoy the Allied supply planes to dropping in the wrong place and into their hands. So whilst British troops were running low on supplies, the Germans were enabled to continue the relentless assault and the gradual squeezing of the defensive perimeter held by the British. Oh, the Battle of Arnhem was crazy indeed. Okay, not only uh, the Germans are having, are, are, are possessing uh, British uh, supplies that are, that are being dropped on uh, German hands because the Germans overran the, uh, the drop zones that the British were supposed to help, but couldn't. However, when when the when the British themselves were so low on ammo, they started using the enemy's weapons, the German weapons. While the Germans are having you know kind of logistic problems of their own, hence you know losing the war, were using British weapons that were captured from the drops. <laughs> See how that works? No, but yeah, the it was it was nuts, bro. It was nuts. In fact, like Frost, like held up to like. The, like the last bullet because he will never surrender. That was the mindset of the first airborne. Uh, anyway. Meanwhile, further south, German forces were launching further counterattacks. Bailey Bridge at Son was almost destroyed by German tanks, while Eindhoven, now a vital Allied supply base, was battered by Luftwaffe bombers, causing widespread destruction. Even so, 30 Corps managed to make up for earlier delays and reached the 82nd Airborne at Nijmegen. But the all-important bridge was still in German hands. The entire operation now hung in the balance. The question was, which bridge would fall first, Nijmegen or Arnhem? Dawn broke on day four. Okay, before we move on, it's kind of like, go back to the video, okay? You see, like, this region over here, okay? As soon as the 82nd Airborne dropped that south of uh, Nijmegen, uh, uh, Browning uh, decided to uh, parachute drop like glider down himself on day one as well and moved his headquarters there as well. Because his original headquarters was in England. Now it's uh, south of Nijmegen. And his orders are to... Uh, I, I forgot what I, I brain for, I forgot what they said before, but this region over here of... Uh, of like of Germany, 
because uh, he believes that there's like a vast pocket of uh, a, of of a German army ready to counterattack. So he concentrates his uh, his fire on that forest, uh, not not concerning about the bridge too much, uh, which he should because like the Germans they they they, they still hold Nijmegen and they practically turn that bridge into a fortress. Or Arnhem. Dawn broke on day four. The British troops in Arnhem and Oosterbeek continued to hold against German attacks. Instead of using infantry, the Germans were simply blasting their way through British positions with artillery, mortars, rockets, and even flamethrowers. At Oosterbeek in particular, only some well timed bayonet charges prevented British battalions from being overrun. They clung on in the north, the 82nd Airborne made their move. Nijmegen Bridge was proving difficult for the Allies to capture, so a plan was devised that men of the 82nd would cross the Vaal River in canvas boats. Due to the shortage of paddles, some of the men had to employ their rifle butts in order to propel the boats across. Despite horrendous levels of casualties during the crossing and in the subsequent assault, they did successfully capture Nijmegen Bridge, which appeared that Market Garden might just succeed. Okay, right. I just want to pause at the uh, at a good timing. Okay, uh, it wasn't just the uh, 82nd that were like paddling from one side one side of the river to the other. Uh, they were also be accompanied as well by uh, by British engineers or British sappers, as they were called. And again, some of them were using paddles, some of them were using the rifle butts. They had to get to the other side of the river. Uh, this is a job of Marines. These guys are just army paratroopers using marine tactics. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, again, this uh this operation is doing stuff that people don't normally do. Well, it's war. People do things that they don't normally do. It is what it is. However, 30 Corps was unable to advance any further towards Barnum. The rest of Nijmegen still had to be cleared, and a significant German counterattack on the Grosbeek Heights had to be stopped as well. As day four drew to a close, Frost and his men still held the north end of Arnhem Road Bridge, but the delay at Nijmegen would prove fatal. Frost's men were facing a very grim situation. They were hanging on by their fingernails, whilst hoping beyond hope for the arrival of 30 Corps to come to their rescue. Amongst the men themselves, they were exhausted. Many of them were wounded. Quite a number suffered from battle fatigue, what will be known today as post-traumatic stress disorder. By the early morning of Thursday the 21st of September, they had no choice but to surrender. They sent a radio message which wasn't heard by the British forces but was intercepted by the Germans, which read, out of ammo, God save the King. Though Arnhem Road Bridge had been lost, it was still a slim chance for Market Garden to succeed. The first airborne at Oosterbeek still held on to a narrow crossing point at Real. If a Bailey Bridge could be built there, the Rhine might still be crossed and victory achieved. But that would be a tall order. And they forgot to mention this is when the Poles start, started to drop in and tried to help the British first airborne. They were, they were taking casualties of their own. But of the initial 10,000 men of the first airborne, only 3,500 remained. As day five began, the Germans attacked hard once again, attempting to batter the British into submission. Instead, the British were saved by the arrival of the Polish 1st Parachute Brigade. It was supposed to drop on day three, but had been delayed by poor weather. Their landing across the river at Driel threw off the German attackers, giving much needed respite to 1st Airborne. In the evening, they were able to make radio contact with 30 Corps, whose artillery support was vital the Allied pocket alive. Yeah, so Montgomery, if instead of uh, blaming uh, Sosabowski, you should be thanking him because uh, Montgomery partially blames Sosabowski's lateness uh, for this failed operation. No, dude, no. Whole multitude of shit happened. Like, don't blame it on partially on one person, asshole. That's all I wanted to say. However, 34 was still unable to reach them. The highway between Nijmegen and Arnhem was raised up, leaving Allied tanks exposed to German fire. Worse still, with the recapture of Arnhem Road Bridge, the Germans were able to bring new troops forward and reinforce their positions. As the sixth day of Operation Dawned, 
Security Corps' attack flew to a crawl. The German response to the Allied landings demonstrated their capacity for improvisation. They formed battle groups, or Kampfgruppen as they called them, who were hastily assembled on an ad hoc basis in order to prevent 30 Corps advancing along the highway to link up with those parachute troops. They identified Weigel as a key point along that route. The Germans directed two Kampfgruppen, who were armed with vehicles such as the Jagdpanther behind me, to attack Weigel, which they successfully did cutting the Allied route for 36 hours. The delay and this pretty much seals the deal of the failure. The delay that the Germans enforced was a serious setback for the Allied plan. By the time that 30 Corps had re-established their lines of communication, it was clear that the men of 1st Airborne would have to withdraw. They were only supposed to have held out for four days, but on the night of the 24th of September, eight days into the operation, Two and a half thousand men crossed the Rhine back to Allied lines. Operation Market Garden was over. Over the following days, the new front lines stabilised around Nijmegen, where Allied forces repelled a German counterattack. In October, Arnhem Bridge was destroyed by the United States Army Air Force, preventing the Germans from launching further attacks. Oh, the bridge that the Allies wanted so badly. If you're like, fine, if we can have it, if we can't have it, you can't either. So we're just going to bomb the living hell out of it. Operation Pheasant was then launched to secure the salient. The next major battle on the Western Front would be the Battle of the Bulge. Okay, so finally they they captured the they captured the uh, the Scheldt, and therefore finally they get their uh, they get a work in uh, port at Antwerp finally solving their logistical problems. But at what price? You have a failed operation beforehand. Operation Market Garden is still controversial to this day. It fails within touching distance of Barnum. So what went wrong? The failure to heed the aerial reconnaissance information during the planning, the decision to deploy the troops over three days, and the ferocity of the German response well, it's failure. Consequently, the war wasn't going to be finished by Christmas of 1944. The Western Allies resumed Eisenhower's broad front strategy, and the Rhine wasn't crossed until the March of 1945. All right. Okay. So there you have it for the video. Uh, more on Operation Market Garden. Also, reason why how um, how this operation failed. Okay, another another reason is the intel that the Allies had. Okay, at first, uh, Dutch underground reported um, only only like a handful of Germans left in the Netherlands, particularly so-called kids and old men. Uh, of course, um, the Wehrmacht what really needed uh, numbers so badly that. They started recruiting people with disabilities, uh, people who are medically unfit, though, but they joined them anyway, called the Eyes and Ears Battalion. The uh, reason why they call it the Eyes and Ears Battalion because you know, people have like, no, no eyes, no ears, no legs, whatever. Right? Disabilities, right? Uh, so that's what they're relying on. But however, the Dutch Underground was give, giving them uh, updated information. You know, Germans of reinforced tanks, more troops, experienced troops. From defeated divisions, uh, but uh, Browning wasn't really taking this seriously because he, because I'm mean, along with Montgomery, really wanted this plan to go ahead. So, but that was another uh, thing that that how the operation failed because of the piss poor intel. Well, they 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 have good intel though, but they only relied on the piss poor one. There you go. I worded that better. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. So, thank you very much for tuning in to uh, to this episode. All right. Uh, let's talk about uh, Arnhem's final liberation uh, before I end the uh, end end this episode. Okay. So, uh, so on April fifteenth, actually. April 12th, 
Uh, this is when the Canadians started to uh, enter autumn and try to fight off remaining Germans there. And on April 15th, 1945, um, and within three days, uh, the Canadians finally the Canadians take Arnhem. And what they find in Arnhem, uh, they found uh, the inhabitants, the local population, uh, starving, especially under a grim winter. Uh, they see this Dutch uh, malnutrition, uh, pretty much really, really, really skinny. Malnutrition. There we go. That's the term I'm looking for. Uh, because after Operation Market Garden, uh, the Nazis really wanted to punish the Dutch uh, for the participation in Operation Market Garden. They're like, okay, since you helped the Allies, we're going to starve you. And that's how the Dutch fa- the Dutch famine happened. All right. Uh, next episode, I uh, will talk about Battle of the Bulge. Uh, I will uh, finish the European theater just so I can move on to the Pacific theater. Uh, in the Pacific theater, we're going to talk about um, a battle at the Philippine Sea. Uh, I'm going to talk about a uh, uh, battle of Saipan, Iwo Jima, Leyte Gulf, Okinawa, and the two atom bombs. And we're going to talk about, final episode, we're going to talk about the most controversial trial of all, Nuremberg. And you think, will this be the end of the Fox Shot Sierra podcast? No, I'm just going to continue making content. Yeah, because there's a whole bunch of stuff I want to talk about. Uh, especially from the First World War and the Second World War. So, stay tuned. Good stuff might happen. <laughs> Alright, um, let's see here. Guys, like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helped me out. It really helped me boost the algorithm. So, anyway, I will pretty much end this podcast here. So, Thanks for tuning in, guys. Have a good day.